We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us for the Naturalist Training, a deeper dive into iNaturalist. Last month, we hosted a presentation as an introduction to community science and iNaturalist, and you can find the recording on our YouTube channel. During the second presentation tonight, we will discuss how to make better observations and then um, add them into projects. And we'll also show how to add fields, tags, and annotations to your observation. All these features will help your observations stand out and will make it easier for experts and you to find it and use it. We will also demonstrate how to efficiently search and filter observations. All these features will not only improve the quality of your observations, but also your ability to learn from the process. Hi, my name is Deb Kramer. I'm the executive director from Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful, and I'll be your moderator tonight. Coyote Creek is an amazing place. And for the past eight years, I've seen how happy people are when they learn about and share what they discover. I used to think I was a very observant person. And then I met Marav and our cadre of docents. And I look at nature so differently. A little bit about Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful. We're a community-based organization that sees Coyote Creek as a resilient ecosystem for all living things to enjoy. We engage, educate, and encourage people by bringing communities together to take action for, learn about, and play along a healthy Coyote Creek. We host creek cleanups, fire blitz events, hiking, nature walks. We even did a backpacking trip this um, past spring. We also provide classroom education and college projects. A little bit about Marav Von Schack, our speaker tonight. She is the founder of the BioBlitz Club, which is a citizen science or community science organization to encourage people to get outside and learn about nature. Through the Scoops action over the nearly past five years, she's hosted over 60 events, actually closer to 100 now. And well over a thousand people have participated and contributed to the growing body of knowledge about nature through iNaturalist. So at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to Marav. Thank you, welcome Marav. Thanks Deb and hi everyone. Uh, and thank you for coming. I'm very excited about this presentation tonight. Um, and I'm excited to see we have someone here from Peru. That's amazing. Um, and yeah, if you want to write down where you're from or something like that, that would be awesome. But uh, otherwise, I think we can get started. So let me share my screen. Okay. So hopefully you can see my screen, There's no problem. And we can get yes. started. Yes, we okay. can see your screen, thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is our second presentation. Um, in case you missed the previous one, last time we talked about community science or citizen science, uh, about different Bay Area programs. So we are based here in uh, San Francisco Bay Area in California, but many of the things that I will mention don't apply just to here, they apply to wherever you are, even if you're in Lima, Peru, which is such an exciting place to be, much more than here. But anyway, uh, I will mention some local uh, things, some local organisms this time, but it doesn't really matter because you could do the same thing wherever you are. Um, I talked about bioblitzes and why they're awesome and why you should try and join some. We have one this Sunday, by the way. Please join us if you are local. Um, we talked about iNaturalist just a little bit, why you should use it if you're not doing that yet and i guess at this point i should say i'm not affiliated with iNaturalist i just use it because i think it's a wonderful tool and i would like to share it with uh, other people because i think you might find it useful as well uh, if you are you know, an avid user if you never used it before this might be useful for you you might get something from this presentation 
Um, and then we talk just a little bit about the app and the website, and this is this will be our focus today. But because there's so much to say, we actually decided that we'll break this presentation into two parts. So, um, oh, maybe more than two. But anyway, uh, we'll have at least another presentation just about iNaturalist, uh, talking about projects specifically, because there's just so much we could say about that. Uh, it will be in a later uh, date, so maybe before uh, our spring uh, big events at the end of uh, April, we will see. Um, okay, so let's dive in. So as I mentioned uh, last time, iNaturalist is basically a uh, social ne network for nature nodes. You take a photo, you share it with this huge group of people from all around the world, and then you might have some interesting discussions, you might get identification for your observations, all sorts of things. But how does that actually work? So let's say, you know, I am walking to my uh, neighborhood supermarket, and as I always do, I look for stuff, because otherwise it's too boring. And then I find a cool mushroom that I'd like to document on my walk. Um, so I take a photo with my phone uh, and then upload it to iNaturalist. So you can take the photo, by the way, either through uh, the iNaturalist app, which you could have either on uh, iPhone uh, uh, smartphone or an Android based, uh, the different apps. Uh, my screenshots are from the iPhone app, but it's pretty similar on the Android. It actually has a few more options. Uh, but anyway, you take the photo. And then, oh, and you can also take the photos using uh, a different uh, camera app. Any camera app that you have on your phone, you could upload that to iNaturalist as well, either through your phone or your computer, which I'll mention later. So once you have your photo, um, it will ask you, what did you see? And it will suggest some things, okay? So it will make some suggestions according to your location and to your photos uh, using AI. So um, it might be correct, it might be completely off. Usually it's pretty great, but you have to keep in mind that it's not always great. So often if I don't know what the organism is and I don't feel comfortable about it, I might choose something more general. Like in this case, it, it suggested shell fungi, which you know is a great option. But uh, you could also click on the little eye icon here and just open Wikipedia, which is directly connected to iNaturalist. And then you can see some photos, uh, read some information about it, and scroll down for a distribution map uh, on iNaturalist. So you could see if that organism is actually found in your area, because sometimes it's not, sometimes it's a bit off. But in general, it works very well. Um, but again, if you're not sure, just choose something more general. In this case, I decided to go with the turkey tail, with that fungus. What else do we have on this screen on my phone? So this is a screenshot again from my iPhone app. Uh, I have the notes. So sometimes it's great to add some notes here. Uh, what was the habitat? Uh, something interesting, you saw some interesting behavior. Uh, a host plant, if it's an organism that is found on you know, a specific plant, you might want to take a note there. Even if you don't know what a plant was, in that case, it's even more important because then you could take a photo of the plant and then you could later on link these observations. I'll mention that. Next, uh, the next thing you could do is uh, think about your privacy. So let's say you take lots of observations from your home. Maybe you want to obscure these observations. If you click there, it will open this little um, uh, menu and then you can choose obscure. Uh, otherwise, the default is open. So it will use your exact location. And of course, for that, you have to have your location services open. That's the first thing you should do after you download the app, because that will allow you to have a very accurate location for all your observations. Um, I suggest to uh, obscure the observation if you need to, if, if there's any need, and I'll mention a few, a few reasons later, uh, other than choosing a different location or doing something manually, because when you choose obscure, you basically save the real information, the real location, and you could 
decide later if you want to share that information with anyone or for yourself to have that information saved. So again, you could leave it open. I usually leave it open everywhere, but sometimes you might want to choose obscure. And then captive or cultivated is often useful. So in general, there's no need to take photos of your dog, cat, uh, nephew, um, or your favorite tree. We don't need that on iNaturalist. It's for wild organisms. But in some specific projects, this might make sense, and you actually need to document something cultivated or captured. Uh, so it's really important to check that little box. And then uh, you could also add your observation into projects from the app. Uh, it's actually somewhat easier to do it uh, on the computer later, but you could do it here as well by choosing projects, and then it will open up uh, a menu with all the projects that you joined. Um, and you, you will see that some projects, some automatic projects, you cannot choose to add your observation into that project, like a BioBlitz, a new BioBlitz project. Uh, it will get all your observations automatically. So there's no need for that, and it's not actually possible. Um, if you haven't uh, had any of these issues before, so, you know, don't mind that, but I'm just trying to answer some of the many questions we got throughout the years of doing these biobilities and this presentation. So these are some of the issues that people encounter. But if you're just starting to use the app, maybe it's it's not uh, any uh, a concern for you for now, maybe in the future. Um, OK, let's see what else do we have in the app. Uh, so you could go to your activity log and see some of the uh, comments that you got on observations. It's much easier to do that on the computer, So, uh, but you could see some of that here as well. Uh, another thing you could do is look for uh, projects. If you click on this one and more, and then you could see uh, the projects that you've joined, projects are features or nearby projects. You could search for projects. Uh, if you're... Uh, join the Bible or something and you want to join the project, this is something that could be useful. Okay, so uh, let's go to our next topic. So how do you get from research grade observation, uh, sorry, from a, an observation that needs ID to a research grade observation? And what does that actually mean? So when we just upload an observation to iNaturalist, it will look like this, okay? So this is uh, an Akman blue butterfly that I documented last week. I downloaded the photo um, to my computer, uploaded to iNaturalist, and uh, the computer suggested the ID. Okay, so iNaturalist suggested Akman Blue, and I accepted that because I know that this is probably correct. Uh, but nobody verified it yet. Okay, so if we look at the, at the uh, page, it says need ID here. Okay, it has the species name and everything, but it says need ID because the community ID requires at least two identifications. So if someone else would look at my observation and verify it and agree here, um, then it will change into uh, research grade, okay? Just like this one. So this is another observation I made last week. Um, and luckily Noriko found it and uh, agreed with my ID, uh, which changed it um, into research grade, okay? Just like we see here. Uh, because we all agree everything is great. By the way, even when it's in on research grade, you could still change that. I, I often see observations of see things like that, and I'm like, oh no, this is actually not correct. And I might suggest a different ID which would make it go back into um, needs ID. Uh, and but I will try to explain why I think that's uh, not correct. And often you can ask people, like, why did you say it's this or that? And people are very um, generous with their knowledge and are happy to share their knowledge in general. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't work as well. And for example, I saw this really cool tree in New York uh, a few months ago, and I documented it, oh, a couple of years ago, I guess, um, and documented that, but I wasn't sure what it was. I thought, you know, it's some abnormal growth. It could be because of a fungus, uh, or another organism, but it could be something else. So I wasn't sure. And I just uploaded that state of matter life, which is basically, I have no idea. But then if you scroll down, you'll see all the uh, information, you know, all the different uh, discussions that 
we had about this specific observation. So it's here to the right. Uh, someone suggested the plant ID, but this wasn't my intention. Okay, but now this was identified as a plant. And then someone else is like, oh, no, no, this is not a plant. It's, it's a fungus. And he knows what is causing this interesting phenomena. But, uh, and I agreed with that. But now we can't get hold of the first person. So now it stays in limbo, okay? It's state of metal life. If you search for plants, you won't see it. If you search for uh, fungi, you won't see it, uh, which is kind of annoying. Uh, there are a few things you could do to fix this. You could tag some people that might be able to help you identify it. And then you basically need another person to agree with a new, the new identification to change that. Uh, so you could either go back to the first person and ask him to just withdraw his ID, or you could ask another person to um, uh, agree with the new identification. So, you know, there are different options to do that. Uh, but then let's continue about our um, process, how to take uh, good photos, how to make good observations that would hopefully get identified. Okay. Um, so some comments about photos, stand still, maybe get a little bit closer. So when you document a plant, it's really important to see the details. When you document anything, it's important to see the details. So with this photo, it's very difficult to tell what it is. Uh, but if you get closer, you could see some more information, right? Uh, you could crop your photo, you could add scale. So if you don't have a real ruler or a coin or something like that, you could use your hand. Um, and then, you know, kind of looking better. But maybe we could just use all these photos together, right? Because they would give us information about the fruit, the leaf, uh, the twig, and an overview of the plant. And because this is one organism in one uh, uh, place and one time uh, that we documented it, it could be one observation, okay? all these different photos because this is the same thing but if we had a bird and a bug and maybe on the same plant uh, those go in a separate observation because we want to be able to identify each one of them separately so the bird would need its own observation the bug would need its own observation we could link them together if we'd like to but they need to be separated okay so what would that look like this is the observation of that cool gooseberry plant that I saw. Um, there are a few different photos. They're all in here. This is what it would look like on my phone. And this is what it would look like on my computer, the same observation. So again, iNaturalist is not just the app. There's an incredible website with far more options than what you have on your phone. You could uh, log in using uh, the same username and password, and then you'll be able to see all your observations. And it will also be much easier to follow uh, on different comments and uh, IDs and different things uh, on your observations and also look at what other people find. Maybe help them uh, identify different things and explore an area, there's lots of stuff you could do. Uh, so that was about documenting plants, but there are lots of other organisms. So let's say you like to document mushrooms. When we document mushrooms, uh, it's important to add some more information, just like with a plant that, you know, an overview from far away is not enough. You'd like to also include more information. So it's always good if you can, if it's allowed to pick one mushroom and uh, show it from the side and even cut the mushroom in like a cross section, because some uh, mushrooms like this one would uh, change the color once you cut them. Uh, and that's a really important indicator when you want to get that mushroom identified. Um, you could also smell it and things like that, but of course, that will be much more difficult to share. Anyway, the next organism is a snail. And documenting snails is actually fun and really important because uh, many of our snails here in the Bay Area, for example, are endangered. So we have some invasive snails. And we have some endangered snails, uh, local snails, uh, native ones. Uh, some of them are endangered. And it's important to see how they're doing. Uh, so when you document a snail, it's also important to include different angles. So you might want to get um, the top, the bottom, the side view. Uh, 
uh, and that will help the snail experts identify your snail. Okay, uh, other interesting organisms to document are leaf miners. So if you never heard about leaf miners before, leaf miners are uh, insect larva, could be a moth or a fly usually, uh, that uh, live between the two layers of the leaf. They're so tiny, their entire, well, most of their life, they spend between the two layers of the leaf. Um, the female fly would lay its eggs on the plant and then the little lava, uh, in this case, it's actually a moth, but the little lava would burrow into the leaf and stay there uh, until they finish feeding usually. Um, and then there'll be a flying adult emerging at some point or just a pupa. But anyway, they most of the feeding period would be inside that leaf miner. So if you want to document that, and I highly recommend documenting that, um, and why, by the way. So I know it doesn't look like much, right? But I started documenting these leaf miners uh, a few years ago when, you know, maybe on a BioBlitz or something else, I documented the leaf miner and uploaded it and someone identified it. And then I uploaded another one, it was identified and another one. And then, you know, I was like, oh, someone is interested in them. In them. Maybe they're important for someone. I can document more. They're not that difficult to find. And it's also an incredible part of the biodiversity that in our area that we usually neglect, like who looks at that thing. And because most people don't even know they exist, there are so many new species that you could discover if you only look right there. So this species, by the way, is actually a non-native one, but there are many native species that feed exclusively on one or a few uh, native species and they only use those species. So again, here it's really important to document the host plant, but not just that, it's also important to look at a few different angles. So a top view, bottom view, and then sometimes I'd like to get like this overview of the plant showing the leaf miner, because this might be helpful for the person who is identifying uh, the leaf miner, because they could use this to identify the plant. And sometimes um, if, you really know how to do it, then you could correct people just by looking at the leaf miner, even without this nice overview, you could say, oh no, this leaf miner doesn't, uh, uh, it's not found on that plant. It's probably a different plant. So I got some, some of my plant ID corrected just because of the leaf miners or golf. And I help other people do the same thing. Uh, but anyway, these are pretty awesome to find. And, and it's also cool to add photos against the sun, which is really nice sometimes because you could actually see the lava. So sometimes you'll see a living lava, it might be moving in there um, and you could get a nice photo of the lava. This is on a different plant and a different lava. Uh, this one is on willow and the first one was on rose. Okay. Um, yeah. Another thing you could do, so it's not just about photos. Uh, you could also document sound observations. So you could record sound on using different apps or even some gadgets, but, um, and, and that would be useful uh, for birds or frogs or cr crickets or other organisms that you might hear, but could be difficult to document when you just have your phone. If you have, you know, a telephoto uh, lens on your camera, you can get some birds, but even then, sometimes you hear many more birds than what you see, okay? Because they're just difficult to photograph, uh, at least for me, because I'm not really good at that. Uh, so I'll often try and uh, record their songs. And then the app won't suggest an ID, but uh, real people might do that later. So uh, now you can actually record sound observations through the app directly. Uh, just like you record uh, a photo, uh, you could record a sound. And then uh, it's important to record more than just a few seconds. So for example, if you're listening to a bird call, if you just record one call, sometimes that might be a bit confusing for the person who is trying to help you identify. It's, it's best if you could record a series of calls because then uh, you could, the, the time between each call is also info, uh, important. So um, a recording of about 20, 30 seconds uh, is pretty good, okay? 
and this is what it would look like okay so you'll have a bunch of observations which is sound but then you could also combine uh, photos and sound observation of the same individual so let's say i was looking at this stellar's j it was really far away but i was able to record its call and get a pretty bad photo but then i can put them together and sometimes it's really cool because it helps me uh, connect the organism and its call. I'm still trying to learn uh, bird calls and uh, crickets and frogs and all these organisms. So seeing the organism making the call is actually really useful, but connecting that is, is pretty great. Um, another common question is, what do we do with a regular camera? So of course, using a regular camera is great because then you could use a good camera with a telephoto lens to take some bird photos. You could use a macro lens to take some bug photos. I mean, it, it allows you to um, document many more organisms. Uh, but then sometimes you could get stuck if you don't have a GPS in your camera, like I do, I, I don't have one, then you might want to add this um, uh, GPS coordinates later on. So how can you do that? One option is to use the coordinates on your uh, photos in your phone, okay? So if your location services are open, then each one of your uh, photos would have uh, geotag uh, information on it. So you could basically um, put together in one folder photos from your phone and from your camera and sort them by time. And then use that to um, add uh, the geotag information. So let's say, um, second, yeah. So these are my observations when I upload them on the computer. Okay, and the location here is missing, but if I'll add one, even one observation um, that does have geotag, or I can also search that on the map, then it will be easier to geotag the rest of them. Okay, I could just click here. I could choose the location on the map and then um, it will add that to the specific observation that I chose or to a group of observations. Okay, if I know that I was taking lots of photos in this area, I could clump them together. Uh, of course, it's, it's better if you have very specific and accurate information, but even if you don't, then sometimes it's, it's good enough to have something a bit less general. Because, for example, you could um, upload observations from your trip five years ago or 20 years ago somewhere, as long as you know the location and the time where you took these photos. And again, the location, if it was before, you know, our photos had uh, geotag on them, then it's okay that you'd say, oh, it was in that preserve. And you could choose something in the middle of the preserve, for example. And you could even say uh, at the note that the, the location is not very accurate, but it was in that area. Uh, and sometimes it's really important because maybe it's a place that not too many people documented stuff, or we don't have that many data points from that time frame. So it could add important information. But uh, watch out because this could be slightly addictive going back or like. You know, tons of folders with awesome photos from the past. Uh, it could keep you pretty busy. Um, okay, another option is to record a GPX uh, track. Uh, and I learned that uh, a year, a couple of years ago. It's really useful. Uh, there's some free apps like this one in here, this icon. Uh, it will record your track for free, and then you could uh, share that with your computer. And you could use a software like Lightroom to geotag all your photos. Um, and that's really useful, uh, wonderful option. Okay. And then what? So you took some good photos. Uh, and by the way, the photos that you take, they can be great, but they don't have to. They could be just, you know, okay photos of whatever, but as long as they have enough information to be identified. And sometimes, even, you know, pretty bad photos would be good enough if it's a very interesting organism or something that's really important for you and you want to share that. Uh, but in general, it's best, best if your photos are very clear um, and could easily show the organism in there. But then what? What do you do with it next? Uh, so there are a few things you could do in order to uh, upgrade your observation. So to make it 
um, to add information into that, okay? It might make it easier to ID or more visible to other people. Um, and also for you, it could be useful if you add all this information. Uh, and of course for research. So don't forget, this is a huge database with millions, many millions of observations that people use for uh, many studies every year. So adding all this information might make it easier for researchers to find and then it would be use, more useful for them for the studies. Okay, so again, this is how uh, this observation would look like on my phone, but uh, this is what it would look like on uh, the computer, okay, with lots of other details other than just, you know, the photos and the ID and location. So let's see what they mean. Uh, so first, we have the annotations. You could add information here. Uh, I can say that this little creature was alive. Okay, great. But also it was a lava. Um, and that's useful because sometimes you want to sort um, all the soulfly. This is called a soulfly. It's a primitive wasp. So maybe I want to see what kind of soulflies were found in this area. So I could sort um, all the observation in my county, for example, of soulflies, and then just sort the lava. Okay, if people use annotations, then I can only get the lava. And then maybe I can find something that looks like this, okay? And identify it. But maybe, I mean, not everything is identifiable, right? Especially the lava. Uh, but maybe I can get a bit closer to what that is. Uh, I can also add um, that I found the organism itself and not a gall, a feather, or scat, or other things that um, could make sense here. The next thing would be fields. So fields are really important because that's a great way to uh, filter observations and find uh, similar observations. For example, if when I observed this little lava uh, back in 2020, I'd write down the host plant. I think that was great because I could have used that to identify the lava. Now I don't really remember. It's been a while. But I think this is ocean spray. So let's say um, I would check everything on ocean spray. But again, I'm not sure. So let's look at something else where I'm actually certain about, or more certain about the host plant. Uh, some of the fields will have like a scroll down menu, open up with different options, there are many different fields, and there's a lot of overlap uh, between them. So, you know, first look at all the available fields before you decide to create one because it's better to use ones that people already uh, created and used for a while. Um, okay. So uh, we will, sh I'll show you a few options uh, for the fields in a minute. Before that, I'd like to uh, talk about projects. So again, project is a huge subject. We'll have a separate uh, presentation for that at some point. But for now, just to say that projects are a great way to interact with other people, to link your observation to other things, because this observation is just for this little lava on that date, right, and that location. But let's say I did document the plant, so now I can connect them, because there is an interaction here, right, between the lava and the plant. So maybe I can add this observation into different projects. And this is just a very short list. I'll, I'll share a few others with you later. But in general, adding your observations into projects is great because um, it's a good way for you to see what other people uh, find in the area when you go into that project later. And it's a good way for people to see your observation and maybe help you identify it. Um, you could also tag experts, okay, to help you identify your little creature. So for example, uh, if you scroll down on this page, you will get to the top identifier of typical soulflies, okay, this category that I have, uh, and you can tag them. And again, people are often uh, happy to share the knowledge and to suggest ID or explain why they think it's this or that. But sometimes they won't reply because, you know, they're busy or they just don't know. And I would like to suggest again to uh, follow up on your observation. Check the ID, check for comments, uh, write to other people, see what they have to, see, to say about it, uh, if it's something really important to you, and don't lose hope, 
because it might take a while, but eventually someone might find your observation and help you with it. For example, I had this uh, bee that I documented a few years ago. It's a pretty cool bee, um, pretty large. I was excited when I saw it on a hike, but you know, nobody identified it much and I forgot all about it. And just a couple of months ago, which was I think two years or three years after I made the observation, someone identified the species. It was the first bee of that species on iNaturalist. And it was on a rare plant, so it was a really interesting interaction between that rare bee and the rare plant. And that was pretty exciting, but you know, it took a few years, but that's fine. We've got time. Um, yeah, so, Marav, so I'd like, yes. Marav, do yeah. you have a moment for some questions? Of course. That are related? Okay, yeah. wonderful. Um, Jane, I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to unmute and you can ask your question. My question's about grouping observations. There are several ways that one could group, for example, seeing the same plant on multiple days at different stages, or seeing several examples of the same plant on a two hour walk through a park. Do you put them all in one observation? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, okay, so it's a great question. So in general, when I asked uh, I naturalist people about that, the answer was that each observation is for one organism at one point in time. So it should be a separate observation, um, but you could link them. So there are a few different ways to link observations, and this is the perfect time to talk about that. So you could write it down here in the comments, okay? You could simply add uh, a comment here that I observed this, you know, plant or lava or whatever uh, again the next day or 10 years later or whatever, and add a link. You could do that using fields, okay? So if you scroll down here, you'll get to fields, and there's one called associated observation, which I use often when I want to link two different observations together. Um, you can create a project if you'd like, if it's something that you want to follow up on, and it's like a plant or a group of plants that you keep visiting, and you want them all to be in one place, to make it easier for you, but also for other people to view, then you can create a project and you set the parameters for the project, okay? Uh, but we will talk about that uh, on a separate uh, presentation, but just in general, the project could be for something like this. I hope this answers your question. And uh, Rick has a question for you as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how do you find or, or search for fields to use for your observation? That's a good question. So you start typing them, and then, so I'll start typing hosts or something, you know, we kind of need to guess. Uh, I think there should be a way to search for, for more fields somewhere else. The way I do it is I, I start typing, and then they will appear like, if I'll type H, it will show me host, host plant ID. It will show me a few different options. Um, if it's something that I use often, it will just come up as soon as I click on fields, it will give me all the previous maybe 10 options that I use. So that's one way to find these fields. Another one is that many projects uh, encourage you to use fields because they're so useful. So for example, if you join a goal project, okay, so goals are these cool structures we find on plants uh, and there are an association between an insect or uh, some other organism and a plant. So when you document them, it's really important to know what's the host plant. So usually when you would add uh, a goal observation into a goal project, it will ask you, it will pop up these fields and it could be one, it could be a few of them. So one could be host plant ID or host. Uh, there could be um, uh, a link to the observation of the host plant. Sometimes you'll have that and sometimes even more specific fields. Uh, same with uh, projects about pollinators. They might ask you for the host plant or the host plant color uh, or uh, not host, sorry, the nectar uh, flowering um, color, these kind of questions. And then you're like, oh, I could use these fields now that I know about them. 
sorry, uh, how do we generate the link to tie the two together? I mean, there's a place there in the comment field where we could put a link in, but where do we get the link to put in? Oh, just a simple link from your browser. So just at the top of your screen, you just get oh, okay. the link, you know, oh, oh, I, see. Uh, so, I naturalist, blah, blah, blah. Because well, each observation, observation has number, its yeah. own unique ID. Okay, great. Uh, with the number. So you copy that in there and that's it. And then people could, uh, you know, click on that, go to the other observation, learn more about that. Sometimes, there's, you know, you identify the observation because you saw another observation that was similar and had a really interesting discussion. So it's it's great to add a link to that other observation. So there are, you know, lots of reasons why you would do that. I was just going to say, they should probably add a link field up to the uh, an observation ID at the top of the observation. But I mean, it appears in the web ID, so I guess they don't feel the need to mm -hmm. actually include it in in the in in their in the interface. The interface, yeah. So I want to give an example for how how you I use fields, okay? Because I find it very useful. So I just mentioned plant goals. So this is a goal induced by a little wasp on a rose that I just saw a few days ago. Um, I've never seen it before. I thought it was really cool. Uh, and I started searching immediately for different things that were found on roses. So how do I do that? Uh, one way is to just, um, well, first, maybe I'll show you uh, how do I add these fields, okay? So I go to fields, I start clicking, right? I start typing hosts and host plant ID, I use two different ones and I write down roses because I'm not sure about the exact species. Um, okay, so this is what it would look like. And then uh, if I uh, right click on that, on the host plant ID, for example, uh, I'll get this menu and then I could choose observations with this field and value. So it will show me all the different observations that someone tagged them with a field of host plant ID roses. And this is why it's great because now I have 1000 observations of at least a hundred species that were documented on roses. Of course, I can narrow that down into like, if I go to the map, I could narrow that down to, you see, it's like pretty wide to maybe California or my county or my area, because uh, most of these species are limited in distribution. Um, sometimes you might want to see everything, but sometimes you want to limit that. And by the way, to limit that, you could either type down here in the location, uh, California, uh, Santa Clara County, San Jose, uh, city of San Jose, stuff like that. Or you could click on these tools here and just draw a rectangle, or a circle around the area, and that would limit uh, the observations to so filter them to just that specific area. So that's also useful. Um, okay, so this is when I look at observations on the map. The previous one was the grid, okay? This is the map, uh, map view, but then I can also click on species. Um, so these are the species. So it's sorted by a number of observations. These are my 1000 observations sorted by species. Um, and here I can find the one that I was looking for, maybe, or maybe not. Maybe it's a new thing to iNaturalist, which, you know, they find from time to time. And it's very exciting, especially when you look at something like that, that not too many people are looking at. Um, okay. You could also click on identifiers and see who are the important people that help us identify all these observations. And you could use that to know who they are. And then you could tag them like, oh, I know Charlie, I could tag him and ask him, do you know what this thing is? Or any of these skull experts here, the really great people that uh, could help me identify my thing. Um, I can also see who are the top observers for that organism, which again, these are things that were uh, tagged with a field host plant ID roses. It's pretty random, but it could be anything else, right? It could be an interesting um, scat, feather, it, any other thing that we use uh, fields for. Um, if that's not enough and I want to filter my observations more, and by the way, this example here, you could use that for to filter 
any group of observations on iNaturalist, okay? Not just um, when you look at things on a plant, okay? This is what the regular screens look like, but just sorted by specific categories. But if I click here on the filters, uh, I can uh, filter it a bit more. So let's say I'm looking for uh, a photo that I took today or on any specific date, or I want to see observations from just uh, the summer month. So I could uh, select a few months here or one, um, or I want to see only the introduced species or only uh, species in captivity or, you know, all sorts of different categories. So this screen is really useful. It's also useful if you want to do some study, if you want to download the data, if you want to analyze it, maybe create some figures, uh, if you want to do something with that. Uh, filter the results to narrow down what you're going to get, because otherwise there'll be a lot of stuff in there. It might be too big, but then you could download that and you'll get a file that you could use on Excel or other programs. Um, so just a little bit about projects. Uh, there are so many different options. Some of them are really interesting to browse because they have really interesting photos. Others are really useful. Uh, the stories behind them are pretty brilliant. And that's why we decided we should have a meeting just about that. Um, but as you can see from this little taste here, uh, this is a really good way to link different things, to, to think about behavior, to categorize observations okay so i have lots of photos of things interacting with ants because that's my thing i like ants uh, so i created a project for different organisms that interact with ants so it could be aphids it could be things that eat ants it could be parasites it could be different things so i can create that project and maybe invite other people to use my project so we'll get there we'll talk about that uh, and then some are just interesting to browse because there's a lot going on in there. Um, when you look at other people's observations, it's always interesting to see what kind of projects they belong to. And that's how I find new projects to follow. Um, so if you want to add your observations into a project, you need to join that project. You could read all the information in there and decide if you want to join that project or not. And then you can add your observations to the project, but usually also other people's observations as well. Um, so that's pretty fun. Okay, so just uh, a few tips and a few uh, comments about BioBlitzes. Again, a BioBlitz is an event where we go together to a park or a nature preserve and or anywhere else. And we try and document as many species as possible within a limited time frame and space. Um, and these events are really fun. I organize plenty of them, mostly with Deb and Keep Credit with Beautiful, but also with other organizations. And if you're not local, you might have other organizations that organize them near you, or maybe you could start some, because it's a, just a really nice way to interact with the community and with uh, open spaces. It's a great way to get to know a new place and collect data that is something really important going back to the same place over and over uh, in different seasons different years there's there's so much you can uh, learn uh, it's not just about the organisms themselves they leave behind lots of different things so animal tracks animal um, owl pellets scat which is a nice word for animal poop uh, evidence of feeding okay different things that show us that some creatures were here and left something behind. Feathers, uh, these are all great. Uh, and they're a great way for us to document what lives in our area. Because we can't see all these different organisms. Some of them are very shy, especially the mammals that live near us. They're very shy. You're not very likely to see them around you uh, and many of the birds. But maybe you'll see some, you know, something they left behind. Um, so that would be a pretty good way to document them. And one last uh, comment here is that dead things, please document dead things. Uh, many people find them too gross. If you're not too gross by that, they're actually important. And if you've been to our previous presentation, then you know that just by documenting uh, dead animals, you could notice uh, 
a scary trend of something happening, something going on, and you can make a difference. Okay, so we have our group that is studying new uh, road kills uh, here locally, and we are hoping to um, build animal crossings for them. We are designing them now. There's a group of experts designing them now just because of an iNaturalist project. So you could do that too. Um, another uh, comment is about documenting biodiversity. When you go out on a bio blitz or just you know on your own or with a group of friends and you'd like to document different things or enjoy taking photographs, um, so at first I would take photos of you know ants and other insects and stuff like that, things that I was interested in. But by using iNaturalist, I got very interested in other organisms. And at some point, kind of all organisms, I guess. Uh, and this is a pretty fun game to try and get organisms from as many uh, categories as you can. Okay, so these are the 13 uh, iNaturalist categories. Um, and it's really fun when you go out to try and get at least one organism from each category. It's more complicated than it seems, but it's pretty cool. So I'll just give a few examples. So for fungi, it's not just the mushrooms, it's the lichens as well, and all sorts of really interesting uh, things that interact with plants, some plant disease as well, some galls. Uh, there's some really cool organisms. Uh, chromista, who are these? So some plant disease, are caused by uh, chromista uh, and then some uh, microscopic life. So a microscope is a topic on its own, but there's so many cool creatures you can find with uh, even just a simple compound microscope. And when I got mine, I, I still can say that I often don't know which kingdom the creatures belong to because they could belong to a few different kingdoms, which is amazing. It's the, the um, highest uh, category. So sometimes I don't know if something is um, a plant or a chromista or something else. But anyway, so these are these creatures. And of course, if you're at the beach, then there are lots of different creatures you could document from this category, the kelp and uh, these kind of creatures. So yeah, just to finish with this list, um, Next group is the protozoa. So there are all sorts of interesting, uh, well, plants are plants, and then protozoa, uh, mollusks, and just before that, uh, arachnids, which are spiders and their relatives, insects, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals. And the last group is other animals, which are like crustaceans that are crabs and roly polies and even centipedes. So other animals that don't belong to any of the other categories. Um, people often ask if they should document non-native uh, species. It's really important to document them, okay? So uh, for different restoration projects, for different studies, it's really important to document them. And they are part of the biodiversity here, uh, even if we should remove some of them. Uh, documenting threatened species. So that's another interesting point. Uh, some people are worried about documenting something endangered or threatened, uh, iNaturalists would automatically obscure observation, uh, the location of these observations. But if you're still worried about that, or if it didn't do it automatically, you could obscure them manually, as I showed you. But it is important to document them. Lastly, I'd like to show you my uh, website, Bioblitz Club, where you could find information about these presentations and about our future events. Some of them are webinars, some of them are local events. So uh, this Friday, we'll have a presentation about plant goals with my friend Michael Hawk. So please join us for that. And then on Sunday, we have a bio blitz at Hellier Park. If you're local, join us. It will be really fun. And then September 2nd, we'll start our fourth Go Week uh, event, which is when people from all around the world will go out and document plant goals. And if you want to learn about them, Join us for the webinar. This event will be a week long, the Go Week event. And that's it. Thank you. So uh, this time we have an opportunity to have any questions that people have for Marav. I know that there was one that um, Rick Mandel had. Uh, yes, uh, when you were talking about um, 
discovering organisms that used a particular field? Is there a way to uh, discover all the fields used to describe a particular organism? I'm not sure. So I think looking at other people's observations of the same organism, you could see what kind of fields they use. Um, you could think, okay, if it's a, you know, a plant pathogen or something like that, maybe you need host or host plant idea. You know, some things you might come up with. Other, other ones, you could maybe look at other people's observations. I'm not sure. Or well, I was, a, or I was hoping yeah. the computer. I was hoping the computer could do that for me. Mm, I'm not sure. There might be an option, and there might be a way uh, to look at lists of fields. I just I'm not familiar with that. Um, but that that's a good question. I will look it up. Also, I just want to point out that in the chat, Efren had added an app um, to document invasive species. Talk about Efren's uh, question. So there are many different apps to use or websites to document specific groups like invasive plants, uh, endemic plant of whatever, uh, different specific things, uh, monarch, um, fireflies. Often they will use also information coming from iNaturalist. So often uh, they will all go into one big database that is using iNaturalist or, they, or the people that use that you know, uh, invasive plant database, for example, would also use iNaturalist. So I, I feel like I just use iNaturalist because you know, people could use that and often they would use that. Uh, but sometimes I will use both. So um, anybody can be an observer, right? That could be little kids even. But um, to validate something, to make it research grade, an observation, um, you need identifiers to corroborate that. But um, do identifiers have to be experts? So have to be vetted or can it be just anybody? Great question. And, you know, it's good and bad that anybody could be, anyone could be an identifier. So a 12 year old can identify your thing. Uh, they're often correct. I mean, there's some brilliant kids using this uh, app, but sometimes, yeah, they, they misuse it or, you know, people think, oh, you know, I, I can identify everything or they want to have uh, a huge record identifying many different things that they don't really know much about. So sometimes it will uh, add some mess into the system. Uh, and there are lots of discussions how to fix that. Uh, there are a few different things people can do, but in general, anyone can identify anything. Uh, when people uh, suggest identification for something that I post or you know something that I see, I often check if, if it's not someone I know uh, or I know through the app, I will check uh, who they are because you can click on their name and often people would write down you have like your profile page so you could write down your credentials there so you know someone identified my beetle and I know that beetles of that specific family are difficult to ID but then I check and I see that oh this guy is a taxonomist working for some museum somewhere so it's like yeah they probably know what they're talking about uh, and then if it's like a kid's page that's also sometimes obvious, but some kids are brilliant. So it's not all the kids that make a mess. Uh, where do I see a map of the species that I observed? Um, so if you click on that species, on naturalist, on the um, identification of that species, it will open up the page for that specific species. And then it will show you um, the distribution map, it will show you a few things. I, I could actually share my screen if we have time later and I can show you how to do that. But on the website, it's it's very easy. Even on your phone, you could see that though. Um, so yeah, so this is my iNaturalist. Let me show you actually my profile page because we just talked about that. So this is my profile page and I could write down, you know, like things I'm interested in and some useful links and all sorts of things. Uh, and to get here i actually clicked on this on iNaturalist right here and then i have my profile uh if i just want to look at my observations which is the most useful link for me uh, i click on this one and then i can filter them into something 
but let's say I want to look at a specific species, okay? Because that was your question. So let's look at this little gall because it was identified a species. Um, okay, so once I click on the name, it will open this species page, okay? So there's a nice photo of that species, additional photos here, all the different observations, and then the dis distribution map, which is my favorite thing because I love maps. So you could see all the places where it was documented before. Okay, the other things you can see here are about that species. So this is Wikipedia. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a page on Wikipedia. Uh, taxonomy. So where is that thing? It's an animal, an arthropod, an insect, uh, Hymenoptera. You know, you can learn a lot from that. Uh, this is where you could find uh, other names. So name in other languages. This one is only found here, so it doesn't have that many. But um, species that are found in other countries might have more names and you could use all these names you could click type all these names to get to that species so yeah there's there's a lot here but i think this probably answers your question you mentioned marav that you uh to uh look at mushrooms and maybe mm -hmm. identify them more you said maybe you could pick them if it's okay to pick them so how do you know if the mushroom is is okay to pick and then what about mushrooms that may be poisonous? What types of um, tips or tricks do you have for identifying them or making sure that if they are, you are safe after you've touched it? So I don't know if I should answer these questions because you know if something happens, then you know you yeah. need to sign a waiver first. But anyway, in, in general, I worked with many mushroom experts. I'm not a mushroom expert, but I worked with many and the mushrooms here in California are safe to touch. I know in some other places that might not be the case, but they're all safe to touch. You could pick them easily from the ground. Uh, another problem might be that, you know, they're protected in the park where you're found. So you're not supposed to pick mushrooms. Usually to just pick one for ID and leave it there is okay, but you might want to check with that specific park and make sure that it's okay. Um, and then, you know, if it's your backyard, if it's not the protected area, then it's not a problem, but then you need to consider, is it dangerous for you? Uh, most mushrooms, at least here, are not. You could pick them, you could smell them, you could even taste them, but, you know, that's what the experts do. I don't do that, but, um, yeah, I don't want to advise other people to do it. I guess I'm timid thinking that my observations might not be very useful. Um, so how does the vast amounts of data that are in iNaturalist get used by people? And uh, you know what what makes observations valuable? I sometimes feel like question. I'm just spotting another instance of a California poppy or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, it might be just another California poppy, but you saw it and you documented it. So now it's yours, you know, and there's something about, you know, your part in this interaction, right? It's interaction between you and the plant. But it's also, the thing is that you never know when something would be important. We are living in weird times, you know, with climate change and all these different things that happening. You don't know when something that is now common might be gone in in this area in the bay area uh, people have witnessed common species becoming um, rare or even endangered uh, within their lifetime and you don't know what common species like poppy that you're documenting now might disappear and because we we could have so much data then we could notice all these trends on ebird for example which is another um, community science platform just for birds, they have incredible data set because so many people use it and uh, so often that you could notice many different trends and, and that's amazing and we should have a presentation about that as well. But um, yeah, so I would say definitely document, I would say document everything. Maybe don't document every single poppy plant you see but maybe one in each habitat, maybe one in each walk, maybe one, you know, what you find interesting, basically. 
um, and then people will find them. So that's why it's important to try and identify your observations because if they all stay with something very generalized like a plant or a mushroom, then it's more difficult for researchers and people that want to identify to find these observations. So it's better if you can identify to a certain level um, and then it could be really useful for people. They might sort, you know, a researcher looking for information about specific plant or uh, a specific location. They might find your observation and they might contact you and ask you for like, oh, can you collect that thing? Or can you provide more information about that observation? And then it gets even more interesting. Okay, so there's, uh, Ron is asking if we can combine uh, observations of the same organism in two different seasons or uh, something like that, right? Yeah, but so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the observation is for a specific organism at a specific time uh, frame. So it's great to document the same thing again, but it should be a different observation. And then you can link them either by just copy pasting the link of the iNaturalist page for that observation. Uh, or with fields, or if it's something you're going to do frequently, you could create a project for that. Uh, but they should be separate observations. Yeah, um, sometimes I find that the choices that are offered uh, when I'm identifying an observation um, don't include um, the subspecies as well as, you know, it's, it's the genus and species, but not the subspecies. Mm -hmm. I'm also working with a flora for a particular preserve. And mm -hmm. so I have a pretty good idea of what it should be, yeah. but that is not actually listed there. Can I enter that or do I just enter the closest thing and hope somebody else comes along and does the ID? So this could be two different things. It could be that it's not an iNaturalist yet. So nobody added that subspecies. And then it's important to add that. Uh, or it could be just that you're not typing it the way I naturally wants it. And I had that before with subspecies. Um, and then what I did, because I didn't have time to study that, I just got it to the species. And then in the comments, I added the whole thing with including the subspecies. Um, but the way to do it correctly is to see how it appears on I naturalist. And one way to do it is to uh, go back to that page I showed you with like the organism, the species page. And then if you go to the taxonomy, it will show you all the subspecies there. And you could copy that from there um, to the ID um, um, box. Uh, but I think, I think the problem is if you have like SSP, you know, like something for the subspecies there, because it should be just the names, you know, three different names without like any um, SP or SPP or something like that. I think if you just have the names, it should take it. So Marav Efren made a mm -hmm. comment about uh, deadly mushrooms in our area. So don't want to eat them unless you can positively identify it. I did have another question. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't I, I didn't mean eat, I meant taste. So some expert again I don't do that they would take a little piece get the flavor and spit it you don't want to eat them okay I agree thank you Efren, for saving me and many others I have a question about sound observations one of the things that I've encountered is that I'll put a sound in identify the observation as birds because I don't know what the bird is and then somebody will let me know at each particular second stop that there are different birds that they're hearing how do I split them into multiple observations? Wow, that's a great question. Um, okay, so, and, and that's true for other things. You know, if you have, you, you made an observation of a plant and then you're like, oh, there's like a bug on it. So someone might suggest to duplicate that observation. So if I go to one of my observations, for example, I could go to edit here, okay? and click on this little thing, it will allow me to duplicate it. So then I'll have two observations uh, of the same photo, same location, same time, but then it will ask for the ID 
okay? So I can add a new name. So in this case, I could say the oak. This is on Coast Live Oak. It's not a good photo to document the oak, but let's say that, you know, for, for this exercise, I could type in Coast Live Oak, okay? And then I can link it to the other observation of the goal itself. Um, so if you have a sound observation and people say, oh, you know, you have five different birds there. So sometimes you might want to get all these birds so you could duplicate it five different times and give each one a different ID. And sometimes you're just like interested in one. So I think that's why it's important to use the comments and say the very loud one or the J or you know something like that that might help the identifier get more specific and that's true with also with photos because sometimes you have in your photo many different things and you want one of them to be identified so you could say this observation is for the big yellow thing you know or the big yellow flower or the lichen to the right or the whatever thing that i'm not sure what it is in the middle you know but be more specific because sometimes there might be a few things there rob just one comment on the mushrooms um i've Heard people say that you can use a small mirror to get an underside view of the gills and get that picture in there as well without sacrificing much. I haven't tried it yet, but it's supposed to work. So you can, and I often use my um, uh, selfie uh, camera for that as well. So I'll stick my phone right under the mushroom uh, and that's pretty useful. But sometimes you might not get all the information you need because the mushroom might have more information in the part that was uh, underground. So, you know, it, it is better if you could pull them out. I often feel bad doing that, uh, or I don't know if it's allowed, so I don't do it, but it's better if you can. Uh, but yeah, but I agree. You could take photos of the underside of the mushroom, maybe move a few leaves out of the way and get a better photo. So Ron was asking if we're taking a photo, for example, and that's a great question. So. On Sunday, when we'll go to Helio Park, we will hopefully be standing by uh, Cottonwood Lake, looking uh, on the other side of Highway 101 on the hill, looking for elk, those incredible um, deer. So hopefully we'll see them. If that observation would be, the location would be at Cottonwood Lake, that would be a problem, right? Because we don't have elk in Cottonwood Lake, but we have them on that hill. So yeah, what I do is I actually move the location manually on that screen that I showed you. So I open the screen and then I can change the location from Cottonwood Lake, which is what it would be geotagged as, uh, into the hill across the highway. And that would be more accurate. And of course, I don't know exactly where it was on the hill, so I could make my circle a bit bigger. But it's fine. I mean, it's there on the hill. It's close enough. So thank you, everyone, for attending. And um, we'll get the recording out as soon as we can in the next day or two. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.